Tonight, the massive winter storm leaving 30 million Americans under winter alerts. New video showing a multi-car pileup on a snowy highway in Arkansas. Semi-trucks jackknife across multiple lanes, heavy rain soaking parts of the Gulf Coast. Roads in Galveston, Texas submerged. The storm now moving towards the mid-Atlantic and northeast with parts of New England expected to see their first significant snowfall of the year. And another system is right behind it. Also breaking tonight, the Supreme Court has agreed to decide whether former President Trump can be kicked off Colorado's 2024 ballot. The state's justice is ruling the former president is ineligible over his actions leading to the Capitol riot on January 6th. When the nation's highest court will hear the case, we'll tell you and why the date is already significant for the presidential election. The tour bus crash in upstate New York, nearly two dozen people hurt when the bus rolled over on a highway near Albany. Authorities on the scene trying to rescue passengers from the wreckage. End of war plan. Israel revealing more plans for Gaza if they eliminate Hamas, who they say will govern the Gaza Strip after this war. A massive fire tearing through a warehouse in New Jersey. The building once the historic Singer Sewing Machine Factory. Why firefighters expect the blaze to burn for days. And you've heard of My Dog Ate My Homework? Well, what about My Dog Ate My Money? That was the reality for one family after their golden doodle chowed down on 4,000 bucks. The stomach turning task to recover most of those funds. Yeah, you guessed it. Top story starts right now. And good evening. We enter the weekend with a major winter storm on the move. Millions from Georgia to Maine bracing for snow, rain and wind. But the storm has already brought dangerous conditions to parts of the country. Take a look at this video from Winslow, Arkansas, near the state's border with Oklahoma. The ice and snow covering the roadways, causing multiple crashes with several semi trucks involved. No word yet on serious injuries there in Texas. Heavy rain drenching Galveston Island. Drivers caught in floodwaters. Part of the Gulf Coast, including the Florida Panhandle, could see isolated thunderstorms and a brief tornado is possible. But that storm now pushing east, bringing some light snow. You see it here in rain to the mid-Atlantic and northeast starting tomorrow. Parts of Florida could also see damaging winds. Cities in New England, like Portland, Maine and Boston, could see four to six inches of snow on Sunday. Across Massachusetts, snow plows are warming up. Salt stacks ready and residents buying those last minute shovels. You see them right there. And that's where NBC's Maggie Vespa tonight leads us off. Tonight, a ferocious winter storm charging east with wrecks stacking up in its wake. In Arkansas, authorities say a burst of heavy snow today stranded numerous semis. Nearby, SUVs wrecked, more semis stranded. It started slipping and sliding, slowed down to about 20 miles an hour. Meanwhile, in Galveston, Texas, streets flooded by heavy rain. This as snow falls in Amarillo. This punishing system now taking aim at the East Coast. I think the storm has been a long time coming. More than 30 million Americans from Maine down through northern Georgia are under winter alerts this weekend, with some cities like New York and D.C. expecting a rain-snow mix, while Boston could get slammed with six inches of snow. Hartford and Albany? up to a foot. We would encourage all drivers uh, and, any, and anyone uh, to avoid travel during this storm. A needed reminder amid something of a snow drought out east. We haven't had a storm in a while. I'm excited. I'm ready to shovel. New York hasn't seen more than an inch of snow in 691 days, its longest streak on record. Philadelphia and D.C. topping 700 days. At this salt yard near Boston, trucks lined up with nearly 300,000 tons of road salt on hand. No one likes snow and ice, but we do. <laughs> You're in the minority here. <laughs> We're in the minority here. Tens of millions bracing for a punishing storm that could bring, for many, their first snowfall in nearly two years. And with that, Maggie Vespa joins us tonight from Chelsea, Massachusetts. Maggie, what cities in the mid-Atlantic and East Coast are bracing for serious weather? Yeah, so Tom, you heard it in that piece, Boston among them, also Hartford, Albany, and those are really the cities that are worried about kind of the, wor uh, the worst repercussions of this weather, especially watching it play out out west. Now, if as the snow hits, pop to a foot in some areas, they're worried about dangerous conditions on the roads. And if the snow is heavy enough, Tom, they're also worried about mass power outages as the storm rolls in.
Okay, we are going to be watching it all this week. And Maggie, we thank you for that. For more on this major winter storm and how it's expected to play out over the weekend, I want to bring in NBC News meteorologist Bill Cairns, who's been tracking this all week for us. So, Bill, walk us through the timing and what we should expect. Yeah, storm one. This one for the bottom line, it's a big inconvenience over the weekend in areas that typically get maybe four of these storms every winter. So they should be prepared, even though we haven't had one in, you know, two years in some cases. So 38 million people are now under advisories and warnings where you see the brighter color here that's where we're going to have the harshest conditions we start with tomorrow morning ice problems from roanoke uh asheville to boone and then the snow will break out through the north here so how much snow are we talking about we're not talking about blockbuster amounts but we will have enough to plow once you get outside of the big cities i do not think we're going to get an inch from dc to baltimore to philly maybe new york could sneak out an inch on the grass but definitely not the pavement but when you get in the interior that's where we could get the six inch totals the mountains could get up to a foot it'll all be ending by Sunday afternoon in New England. Okay, and then Bill, I know there's a second storm that you're tracking as well. Tell us about that. Yeah, this storm is not just big, but it's actually going to be dangerous, maybe even damaging, maybe even life-threatening. So this storm is going to be problems. So it comes onto the West Coast as we go throughout Saturday. Sunday, it's going to move down to the Four Corner region. Kind of a typical winter storm for the West over the weekend. Then on Monday, this storm explodes. It's going to be a powerful storm, very strong winds with this storm. Maybe blizzard conditions possible from St. Louis near Chicago by the time we get to Monday night into Tuesday. And then a heavy rain event for the East Coast. So there's a couple different issues besides just the snow part severe weather, maybe even a few strong tornadoes. Monday, Houston, New Orleans, Panama City will be watching you on that I-10 corridor along the Gulf. Then Tuesday, Tampa, Orlando, northwards through the southeast coastline. And then we're going to finish this storm up with a really big flash flood and river flood event in areas of the northeast. This is Tuesday. Anywhere in blue has a chance of flooding. Tom, we have areas that have a chance of getting about six to eight inches of snow and then three inches of rain on top of it next week. We're going to have a lot of water issues next week. No, I'm glad you're telling us this because so many people are focused on this weekend storm. They have to know what's just behind it. All right, Bill Karens for us, Bill. We appreciate that. We're also following breaking news out of Washington tonight. The Supreme Court agreeing to decide whether former President Trump can be barred from the ballot for his role in the January 6th insurrection. The justices will review a ruling by the Colorado Supreme Court saying Trump may be taken off the ballot under the 14th Amendment, which bars anyone who has participated in an insurrection from public office. Arguments now set for February 8th, right in the middle of the Republican presidential primaries, with a decision expected soon thereafter. For more on all this, I want to get right to NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos, who joins us now live on set. So, Danny, when the Supreme Court made this decision, tell me what, what you thought and how we should interpret this. There is so much to talk about with this because it, in many ways, Donald Trump has much better odds to remain on the ballot. And I only say that not as uh, no matter what side you're on, there are so many things that have to align to remain for Donald Trump to be kicked off the ballot. Any of those that fail and Donald Trump returns to the ballot. Just for example, the Colorado trial court in this case concluded that Donald Trump was an insurrectionist. However, it concluded that he was not covered as an officer under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. So, for example, even in a finding that he was an insurrectionist, he was not removed. So the Colorado Supreme Court did find that he was an officer within the meeting of the 14th Amendment. But there are many other things. For example, Donald Trump is arguing now that Colorado, Colorado's courts don't even have the power to hear this issue. It is something committed exclusively to Congress. And unfortunately, it's a common complaint with the Constitution. Fantastic document, little bit vague in some areas. And this is one of those areas. But I want to make sure I understand you. Are you saying that you think the threshold is so high for Trump to be kept off the ballot that the Supreme Court is not going to rule that way? No, I mean, so many different binary choices have to line up all in one way in other, for Donald Trump to be kicked off the ballot. It's going to be difficult. Any difficult one case of them, to, to, to exactly. Win. Any okay. one of them fail, then Donald Trump returns to the ballot. So if you're just playing the odds, they uh, Donald Trump only needs to win on one of these issues. For example, what if the courts aren't supposed to hear this? What if it is committed to Congress? Then... It doesn't matter that the Colorado court found that he's an insurrectionist, and it doesn't matter that they found he's an officer. It may not be an issue that the courts can mm -hmm. even decide. That's an example where two of those issues went against Trump, but one, the court's not being able to hear it, goes for Trump, 
he returns to the ballot. Several thresholds, and maybe I should have framed it that way. Um, so let me ask you this. Explain this to, to our viewers. So why on the issue of immunity? They w didn't want to hear the case right away, but this one they're going to rule pretty fast. It's a procedural issue. The immunity issue was going through the normal federal courts process. It started in district court, then it went to the D.C. Court of Appeals. And what Jack Smith wanted to do is reroute it, skip the D.C. Court of Appeals, which is an extraordinary request. This is a little different. You have here a decision in a Colorado state Supreme Court, and that's not normally wending its way through the federal appellate process. What's also interesting, too, is I'm curious to see how the Supreme Court handles Colorado vis-a-vis -vis all these other states. It may decide some universal issues that can be applicable to the other states, but what's, what Maine is doing in Maine is under Maine law, and it has a separate procedure, and in fact, it's only in its infancy. That was an administrative decision. If it goes to the Maine courts, the Supreme Court might say, hey, we got to wait for this to run its course in Maine. We're only deciding Colorado. So to be clear, it's not going to be a blanket ruling. It's going to be focused on Colorado, and Maine will have to, the case in Maine will have to make its way to the Supreme Court? It could, here's a way it could be. For example, the Supreme Court might say, okay, as a matter of law, United States, Donald Trump is an officer within the meaning of Section 3. That might be something that all the states would be bound by. But what it won't do is say, co under Colorado law, the Colorado Supreme Court either got it right or got it wrong. But it won't say gratuitously, oh, by the way, we were paying attention to Maine, and here's what we think about the Maine decision. It can't do that. Maine's issues are not before this court. Yeah. In fact, uh, in theory, the Supreme Court could maybe consolidate some of these cases, but no one's even petitioning the Supreme Court to do so, and the clock is ticking. So even if we get a decision on Colorado, that may be cabined to Colorado, right. the state, and we're left wondering, well, what happens with Maine, with Michigan, with all these other states? We'll know in a couple months. All right, uh, Danny, we thank you for all that. Appreciate it. Now to breaking news out of upstate New York, a tour bus rolling over and crashing. At least one person killed and nearly two dozen injured. Parts of I-87 completely shut down. Emily Aketa is on this one for us tonight. Tonight, an investigation into a deadly crash in upstate New York. Passengers seen waiting for help after their tour bus ran off the roadway and rolled over this afternoon. Belongings strewn throughout the dirt. Multiple subjects trapped under the bus. One person died from the crash and 11 others were hospitalized, according to state police. A section of I-87 southbound in Lake George shut down for hours. Oh my gosh, it's a whole bus. Authorities say the passengers, mostly Canadian, were traveling from Montreal to New York City, crashing about three and a half hours north of their destination. We're going to make sure that they have somewhere safe and warm to go tonight. They have food and help them connect with their friends and family. Several months ago, a bus carrying high school students to band camp tumbled down a 50-foot ravine in New York, killing the band director and a retired teacher. Officials said a tire failure may have been to blame. Tonight, the NTSB is monitoring the latest travel tragedy. As the operating company Flixbus assures, authorities are conducting a full investigation. Emily Ikeda, NBC News. Okay, we turn out to another headline. It's been a busy Friday night. The resignation of the longtime head of the NRA and one of the most influential voices in conservative politics. Wayne LaPierre stepping down as he's accused of defrauding his own organization for personal gain with a civil trial set to begin in just days. Gabe Gutierrez has the latest. Wayne LaPierre has led the National Rifle Association for more than 30 years, but tonight one of the most powerful lobbyists in U.S. history is announcing his resignation just days before the start of a corruption trial. We are seeking an order to dissolve the NRA in its entirety. In 2020, New York Attorney General Letitia James brought a civil lawsuit against the NRA and LaPierre, alleging fraud and financial misconduct. LaPierre is accused of using the NRA's money for personal expenses, including expensive suits, chartered jets, and makeup artists for his wife, allegations the NRA and LaPierre have denied. To stop a bad guy with a gun, it takes a good guy with a gun. LaPierre helped build the NRA into a political powerhouse, but recently membership had dwindled amid financial problems. The NRA tried to declare bankruptcy, but a judge dismissed that case, setting the, the stage NRA for a member. legal showdown with the, the New York Attorney, Attorney General, who today said LaPierre's resignation validates our claims against him. 
For its part, the NRA is citing health reasons for LaPierre's resignation. And in a written statement, he says, I will never stop supporting the NRA and its fight to defend Second Amendment freedom. Gabe Gutierrez joins us tonight from Washington. Gabe, do we know what the future of the NRA is going to look like with LaPierre stepping down? Well, Tom, LaPierre officially will step down at the end of the month. Then the NRA's head of global operations will take over as interim CEO. That's in the short term. In the long term, that's a much more complicated question, and it hinges a lot on this civil fraud trial. Initially, Letitia James was seeking to dissolve the NRA. A judge rejected that idea but allowed the lawsuit to move forward. It's expected to last six weeks, and LaPierre is expected to testify. Tom. Gabe Gutierrez, great to have you back on Top Story. We thank you for that. Moving now to the Middle East today, Secretary of State Antony Blinken arriving in Turkey, marking his fourth visit to the region since the start of Israel's offensive against Hamas. Officials there are saying they are now able to identify deceased Israeli hostages using AI. Josh Letterman is in Tel Aviv with the latest. Tonight, Israel says it's closing in on Hamas's southern Gaza stronghold. As Secretary of State Blinken begins a whirlwind Mideast trip, an urgent mission to tamp down spiraling regional tensions. While in Gaza, the UN says nine in ten children under two now face severe food poverty. This father says for three days he's been unable to find milk, now feeding his baby warm water. Meanwhile, another Israeli family is grieving. 38-year-old Tamir Adar, taken hostage by Hamas during the October 7th terror attacks, declared dead. NBC News got rare access to Israel's National Center for Forensic Medicine, where experts have been identifying the more than 1,200 people Hamas killed on October 7th. And now a panel of three doctors, a detective and a rabbi has an unprecedented task, determining which hostages in Gaza have died by combing through intelligence and video. We look at the security camera and see breathing, or we see movement of the eyelids, or sometimes see marks that appear on bodies only after they did. The panel has already declared nearly two dozen hostages dead without ever examining the bodies using new technology. We saw by artificial intelligence that there is no blood flow in the face. Boaz Almanovich got the heartbreaking news. His 80-year-old father, Ariet, was declared dead, in part by using video posted by Hamas. Now he just wants his dad back from Gaza. I know that he is dead, but for him, that he is not laying rest in the, in, in the land. He is not closure for him. There are still 108 hostages that Israel believes are still alive in Gaza, including six American citizens, with dozens more believed to be dead, their bodies still being held by Hamas. Tom. Josh Letterman from Israel tonight. Josh, we thank you for that. We want to stay in that region now. Tonight, NBC News has confirmed the country's intelligence agency, Shin Bet, has launched a special unit with the sole purpose of tracking down top Hamas leaders around the world. Its first target killed in an airstrike in Lebanon earlier this week. NBC foreign correspondent Raf Sanchez has the details. The strike was precise, targeted, and risky. A drone attack south of Beirut, taking the life of Saleh al aruri the deputy leader of Hamas. The assassination carried out in a stronghold of Hezbollah, the Iranian-backed Lebanese militant group that's now threatening to retaliate against Israel. While Israel has not officially claimed responsibility, four sources tell NBC News it was behind the strike. The opening shot of what's likely to be a worldwide, years-long campaign to hunt down and kill Hamas leaders responsible for the October 7th attack. The head of Mossad, Israel's lead spy agency, saying every Arab mother should know that if her son participated directly or indirectly in the massacre of October 7th, he will bear responsibility. An Israeli official tells us the country's intelligence agencies have formed a special unit to lead the hunt, codenamed NILI, a Hebrew acronym for a verse from the Old Testament. Fifty years ago, Israel mounted a similar assassination campaign against the planners of the 1972 Munich Olympics massacre, when 11 of its Olympians were killed in an attack by Palestinian militants. Hamas offices are spread throughout the Middle East, from Turkey to Lebanon to Qatar. But Israel says its top target, Yahya Sinwar, the man who ordered the October 7th attack, is still in Gaza with his top lieutenants.
We know they're in Gaza and we will get them. Israel's military says they've killed or captured roughly 9,000 Hamas fighters, around a third of the group's total fighting force. But in its pursuit of Hamas, Israel has also laid waste to Gaza and killed more than 15,000 women and children, according to the health ministry in the Hamas-controlled territory. That's far more civilians killed and at a faster rate than during U.S. strikes against ISIS in the battle for the Iraqi city of Mosul. Can you really tell the world you're taking care of Palestinian civilians when you're dropping 2,000-pound bombs in densely populated urban areas? Well, those kinds of comparisons you made, it's, it's not the right thing to do because uh, Mosul is not Gaza. Gaza has been built as a terror stronghold of Hamas building more than 500 kilometers of tunnel system underneath hospitals, underneath UNRWA bases, underneath schools, underneath houses. All right, with that, Raf Sanchez joins us tonight from Tel Aviv. Raf, I want to go back to something you had in your report there, this code word for that mission. It's called, I think it's pronounced Neely. What's the meaning behind it? Neely, that's right. So, Tom, it comes from a Bible verse, which basically means the God of Israel is steadfast, unchanging, cannot be swerved. But it was also the name of a World War I Jewish spy agency. So long before there was the state of Israel, there was this Jewish spy agency working with the allies against Germany in World War I. And people here, when they're joking, but also not joking about the importance of intelligence, they say that before there was the state of Israel, there were Israeli spies like these ones. Tom. Raf, I also know you have some new reporting. The big headlines, at least here in the U.S. right now, are about sort of the new war plan in Gaza. I know you spoke with, with a military spokesman for the IDF. What did they tell you? Well, they told us that their focus right now is on the south of Gaza. That is where Hamas's leaders are hiding, they say. But, Tom, it is also where most of the two million Palestinian civilians in Gaza are concentrated. And I asked him, given that the fighting is in the south, when are they going to allow those displaced Palestinian civilians to get out of harm's way to return to their homes in the north? He would not give a timeline on that. And he said, ultimately, it is a decision for the Israeli government, not for the Israeli military. Tom. Raf Sanchez for us from Tel Aviv. Raf, we thank you for that. And still ahead tonight, the deadly plane crash in the Caribbean. An object seen falling from the sky into the water. An American actor and his two daughters among those killed. The investigation now underway into the cause. Plus the deadly triple shooting in Georgia that prompted a citywide lockdown. What we've just learned about the suspect, authorities were calling armed and dangerous. And the two men accused of a multi-million dollar fraud scheme using Airbnb. Were you a victim? How authorities say they tricked renters in several cities and even led some of them into bidding wars just for a place to stay. Stay with us. Next tonight to an Airbnb scam that authorities say cost users across the country millions of dollars. Two men are accused of double booking rental properties and only letting the guests who paid the most stay, leaving the others with nowhere to go or putting them in rundown properties instead. Juan Venegas spoke to one victim who brought this scheme to life. Authorities are calling it a double booking bait and switch scam that cashed in $8.5 million, according to a new indictment unsealed on Wednesday. Two men, Shrey Goyle of Miami and Shanique Rahia of Denver, are facing fraud charges for over 10,000 misleading listings on short term rental sites, Airbnb and Verval. These individuals controlled about 100 properties throughout the country. They were located in Los Angeles, Denver, Chicago, Savannah, South Bend. Cleveland, Nashville, Austin, and Milwaukee, among other places. They would use these properties to double book and drive out the prices for the properties. When it came time for the consumers to use the properties, they would then cancel on the people who weren't the highest bidders. Authorities say the scheme had several moving parts, using numerous fake host accounts with names like Alex and Brittany, Jess and Tyler, or Chris and Becky. Goyo, Raheyu, and their associates would post multiple listings of the same property on websites like Airbnb and Verbal at different prices on the same dates. Once booked, they'd select the guest who booked at the highest rate. 
Others would get an urgent call minutes before their check-in, explaining an unforeseen issue like a plumbing mishap. Guests were then offered a different property, misleading them to think it was similar or even an upgrade. I attempted to rent an Airbnb in Chicago with friends and was told at the last minute that I wouldn't be able to check in due to a plumbing issue. Ali Conti fell prey to the scam while on vacation with friends. She says the host told her she would need to stay at a location different than the one she had booked, sharing photos of what looked like a clean eight-bedroom house. Instead, she says she arrived to find a grimy rundown home. It was kind of in squalor and then found out that I was unable to get a refund. I begrudgingly stayed at this disgusting new location for a couple of days. A seasoned journalist, Conti started digging. Others who booked with the same host, sending her photos of tattered furniture with apparent cigarette burn holes. Much of what she uncovered became the basis for the DOJ's investigation. They received essentially a steady stream of emails from people begging for help. According to the indictment, promises to guests of a half or full refund for their troubles went unfulfilled. And if guests canceled, Goyo and Rajita allegedly lied to the platforms, saying guests had stayed in the property. Many of the victims they harmed identified as black. Just as concerning is that they would base their decisions on who to rent to based on discrimination and prejudice. An attorney representing Mr. Goyle telling NBC News his client denies allegations and looks forward to defending against them in court. After four years, Conti finally seen progress. How does it feel to know that there's an indictment? Now I just feel really grateful that, you know, the victims that I spoke to trusted me with their stories and that the DOJ took this seriously and have actually done something about it. Guad Venegas joins us tonight from Miami. So, Guad, what are Airbnb and VRBO saying about all this? Well, Tom, it's been a few years since this happened. According to the indictment, these scammers began operating in 2018. The victim we spoke to says she was scammed in 2019. So Airbnb says they've been able to make changes. They were also able to identify those accounts and remove the users that were associated to the scams. Now, the changes they've made include asking for verification for both listings and also for the users on the site that they hope will deter others trying to scam in the future. Uh, Verbal has not responded to NBC News for this request for comment. But again, all of this happened years ago, so there has been time for the companies to make changes and moving forward, Tom. All right, Guad, glad you uh, flagged this for us. We appreciate it. When we come back, the Warehouse Inferno, a historic complex in New Jersey, engulfed in flames. Look at that. The smoke stretching across state lines, why authorities say this could take days to put out. Back now with Top Stories Newsfeed and Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin has been hospitalized for several days. Late today, the Pentagon saying in a statement that Austin was admitted to Walter Reed on New Year's Day following complications from an elective medical procedure. It's unclear what went wrong or when he'll be released, but the Pentagon says he's, quote, recovering well. An arrest just made in a deadly shooting spree in Forest Park, Georgia, just outside of Atlanta. Authorities say the suspect followed his ex-girlfriend into a tax filing business and fatally shot one of the employees. He's then accused of shooting a convenience store worker and a construction worker at random. The shooting sparking a citywide lockdown after a brief chase, a 33-year-old was taken into custody. And a massive warehouse fire in New Jersey's Newark, near New Jersey's Newark Airport, I should say. Look at this, aerial video shows flames engulfing the industrial park, columns of thick smoke billowing from the collapsed roof, even stretching to New York's Staten Island. The buildings make up the original Singer Sewing Machine Factory from the 19th century. Officials say the building's old materials are making the fire difficult to fight. It's expected to burn at least until tomorrow. So far, no injuries reported and no word on a cause. Now to power and politics in the race for the White House heating up. President Joe Biden today warning voters democracy is at stake in November. It's part of the president's latest push to separate himself from former President Trump. Peter Alexander reports. This is not rhetorical, academic, or hypothetical. Whether democracy is still America's sacred cause is the most urgent question of our time. It's the president's latest effort to draw a contrast with Mr. Trump, who he's warning is an existential threat. And yet Trump and his MAGA supporters not only embrace political violence, but they laugh about it. Mr. Trump in Iowa firing back. That's why Crooked Joe is staging his pathetic fear-mongering campaign event in Pennsylvania today. Did you see? He's saying, I'm a threat to democracy. He's a threat to democracy. 
Tonight in the crucial Philadelphia suburbs, President Biden's message resonates with Democrat Elaine Tyndall. Is democracy an issue people are going to vote on in 2024? I really think so. I have very positive, I have to be positive, that people are really going to understand that we can't continue without democracy, that everything else we can work out. But democracy, but and in your eyes, Donald Trump, would be the end of it. But for so many, the top issue is the economy, and 62% of Americans disapprove of President Biden's handling of it. Republican Nick Carnelia is one of them. Managing his family's deli, he's already had to raise prices twice in the last three years. When it comes down to our bread, or meats, cheeses, sodas, even chips. All costs more. All costs more, and it, costs, it raises prices for everybody. Is it starting to come down? No. Nothing is really going down. Everything keeps going up. Peter Alexander for us. Peter, thank you for that. And of course, all eyes are on Iowa, which is 10 days before the state's caucuses. Former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley in Iowa today, hoping to gain more traction against Donald Trump. Haley spoke with our Dasha Burns, who has more from Iowa. Tonight, Donald Trump is the overwhelming favorite, but his former U.N. ambassador looking for an early upset. Though in Iowa, polls suggest many caucus goers think Nikki Haley is too moderate. Why aren't you doing better among conservatives? I am doing fine among conservatives. Just because my opponents say something doesn't make it real. But it's not just the opponents, it's also the polling. Look at my record. I don't care what anybody says. I am a hardcore conservative. I always have been. Haley's campaign recently sidetracked when a voter asked about the cause of the Civil War and she did not mention slavery, an answer she later clarified. What do you say to people who say that you've really had challenges when it comes to talking about race? We were the only Indian family in our small southern town. I was teased every day for being brown. So anyone that wants to question it can go back and look at what I've said on how hard it was to grow up in the deep south as a brown girl. The Civil War's always been known about slavery. I misread it and thought he was looking for a bigger answer going forward. So critics can say whatever they want. Haley's rise prompting new criticism from Trump, including this ad accusing her of being weak on border security. Haley's weakness puts us in grave danger. How far would you push on the anti-immigration agenda? Well, first of all, I passed one of the toughest anti-illegal immigration laws in the country when I was governor of South Carolina. <laughs> but these caucus goers supporting Trump say they're not swayed. Do you think anyone besides Trump has a chance here in Iowa. No way. No. no. Dasha Burns, fresh off her interview, joins us tonight from the campaign trail in Iowa. Dasha, I want to ask you about some other news you made in that interview when you asked Nikki Haley if she would ever consider running with Governor Ron DeSantis. What did she tell you? Yeah, a, a pretty surprising answer there from uh, the ambassador, the former ambassador, Tom. She said maybe when I asked her if she would consider DeSantis as her vice president, as her potential running mate. She said, you know, she thinks that she can win this thing on her own, but she would be open to joining forces if that's something that he wanted. And that was a really big contrast, Tom, from the answer that we got from Florida Governor Ron DeSantis when we asked him if he would join forces with Haley. He immediately said absolutely not that uh, her voter base and the people that she is courting are so different than the voters that he is going after that he didn't think that would be helpful to him at all. So uh, a pretty big juxtaposition between those two answers there, Tom. You know, and Dasha, speaking of Iowa and Nikki Haley, what's her ground operation like? How would you compare it to, say, former President Trump's ground operation and as well as Governor DeSantis? Yeah, it, it really hasn't been as robust. I mean, DeSantis started to build out an infrastructure here early last year. Trump has a pretty significant ground game. A lot of uh, precinct captains all across the state, they've really invested here almost as a beta test for their general election. So those two campaigns, really strong infrastructure. Nikki Haley, not so much. They've really only recently started to really pour resources here. A lot of ad dollars uh, for the next couple of weeks, but most of her focus has really been on New Hampshire uh, versus here in Iowa, Tom. Dasha Burns with another big interview from the campaign trail. Dasha, thank you for that. Now a top stories Global Watch and a check of what else is happening around the world. We start with an update on American fugitive Nicholas Rossi. He's been extradited back to the U.S. 
You may remember the 36-year-old registered sex offender. He's wanted in Utah for rape. He's accused of faking his own death and hiding out in Scotland before he was caught while being treated at a hospital for COVID-19. He's insisted he's a victim of mistaken identity. He will now be turned over to authorities in Utah. A judge in the Dominican Republic has ordered the conditional release of Major League Baseball player Wander Franco. The Tampa Bay Rays shortstop in court today over allegations he had a relationship with a 14-year-old girl. He was detained earlier this week on accusations of sexual exploitation and money laundering, but has not yet been formally charged. The judge allowing him to leave the country, but must return to the DR once a month to meet with authorities. And South Korea has ordered evacuations from one of its islands near the border with North Korea. South Korea says North Korea has fired 200 artillery rounds into the sea near that island in violation of a fragile 2018 accord. So far, no injuries have been reported. But in 2010, four South Koreans were killed when the island was bombed. This round of artillery fire came one day after a joint naval drill between the U.S. and South Korea ended. Coming up next, how one couple's dog nearly cost them $4,000. This is a wild story. Their golden doodle snatching a stack of cash off the kitchen counter. What they had to do to get that money back. You'll hear from them next. We're back now with the story of one dog with very expensive taste. A Pennsylvania couple discovering their normally well-behaved pup had eaten, get this, about $4,000 in cash right off their kitchen counter. Rahima Ellis has their story and the unpleasant recovery mission they went on to salvage all that money. Good boy. This Pennsylvania couple says their dog, Cecil, never gets into trouble. Yeah, yeah he's normally pretty much like this. <laughs> Just kind of <laughs> like really likes to intensely stare at people. But that all changed when Carrie and Clayton Law found that their 70-year-old pup had hopped onto the counter and ate a very expensive snack, $4,000 in cash. Cecil's just standing there on top of this pile of, you know, just mutilated money, torn, bite marks, envelopes completely missing, and I was just kind of in shock. The laws had taken the money out of the bank that day for a home improvement project, setting it on the counter and walking away momentarily. That's when Cecil got his paws on the paper and devoured the bills. It's so out of character for him, and so I was just, like, trying to process, like, is this even real? Like, what's <laughs> happening? And then I just, like, yell out to care. I'm like, Cecil ate the money. He ate the $4,000. Luckily, Cecil was okay. But in the days following his pricey meal, the laws were faced with a messy recovery mission, determined to save the money by any means necessary. I'm just, like, <laughs> following him, you know, <laughs> each time he goes out and see if he goes. And, uh... He went and uh, it, it, lo and behold, there was definitely like, like visible money yeah. in there. So I was like, hey, this I'm just going to pick it up, grab it, and then we'll, we'll kind of <laughs> sift through it. <laughs> Detailing their journey in this now viral video, the laws were able to piece together the shredded cash, salvaging $3,500. That's another 50 bucks. I called our bank, uh, explained the situation. I said, you're going to think I'm crazy, but this is what happened. Um, and they said, actually, this happens from time to time. They, they see this where animals will eat money. And so uh, they uh, said if we brought in the bills, if they had the majority of both serial numbers, we would be able to have those replaced. Cecil's parents happy to get some of that money back in the bank and relieve the mischievous pup has a clean bill of health after one very costly treat. Good boy. Rahima Ellis, NBC News. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Stay right there. More news on the way. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.